Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this is our, uh, I believe, fourth or fifth uh, webinar. Uh, today we're going to be discussing process flow, which has uh, got several different names. Um, you know, the latest name for it is uh, Lawson's Process Automation, LPA. Uh, the reason I called this uh, webinar process flow is the one that I think most people uh, know, uh, and uh, that, that's kind of the name everybody um, has grown used to. In fact, it is actually a very good name for it. Uh, before, um, during the registration, we asked you whether or not you've uh, used Process Flow before, and it, it turned out about 40% of you had, 40% of you never have, and then a good 20% have used it in the past, but not enough that it was a, a significant uh, experience for them. So uh, with that said, uh, since the majority is not, uh, very used to the tool, we're going to keep the conversation relatively uh, basic to begin with, and then we'll get into some advanced um, uh, items uh, later on. Uh, so what's covered in this course, uh, we're, we're going to briefly discover what process flow is. Uh, we're going to introduce the different components and terminology to you. We're going to uh, go over the tools and introduce some of the tools and the menus. We're going to actually try to build a, uh, a flow um, on air here, so uh, that that's kind of asking for it. But uh, hopefully, hopefully things will work out to our to our advantage. We've, we've taken some steps to make sure they do. And then um, we're going to talk about some imp implementation methodology, and then some, uh, as we always do, some troubleshooting. So what is process flow? Uh, so it helps to know kind of the history of how this all came about when uh, when the product uh, went from uh, being uh, more terminal driven like uh, all within lid to web driven uh, some technologies were developed um, and back then they were called iOS so these were like internet services that would enable you to do things uh, within the application using a different kind of a client so uh, the web being one of those clients well some of those tools, when they were developed, they were they were relatively agnostic to how you were running um, uh, the process itself. So, if um, if you were per se running a uh, an action on a screen, uh, the tool that was actually performing that action didn't really care where the call for that action came from uh, so much as it cared what the specifics of that action were. Um, now, the, the advantage of all that was uh, someone discovered that, hey, well, we can use these tools to build very complex and rich interfaces. So they, did, they created this tool called Process Flow. Uh, and uh, and which which has had like I said several names since then and Processful Professional is what uh, or Processful Integrator uh, are some of the tools that uh, most of you have heard and know about. So some of the things you can do with this tool with this uh, web-like interface that sits between different components of the Lawson application and uh, and and you uh, or any other piece of it um, are uh, what you see on the right side of the screen there. So um, just briefly, so you can you can perform almost any action on almost any screen. Now the word almost here might confuse you, but let's just say any action on any screen. You can send and create uh, emails with with uh, all kinds of complex logic in it. Um, you know different uh, uh, bodies and different sub subject lines. You can attach items to emails and things like that. that that's actually one of the most powerful things that you can do uh, when it comes to uh, sending notifications and, and, and things of that nature. Uh, you can access the database. So, um, and you can access actually any database. So the, uh, the idea is you can, you can access a database to create a query to return data, or you can actually, actually, actually access the database to perform an update or a change. Uh, you can read and write to files. So flat files, CSV files, um, you know, files of any nature, you can read and write to them. Uh, those are files on the server or in case of, depending on your configuration, you can read and write to files on different servers as well. Um, the RM node there, that, that is your resource management node, the, the, that's when you get to uh, play with uh, 
user set up the, the actual resource, let's say a, a user on your system. So you can uh, technically create new Lawson users and modify them, update them. Say you got a new hire, you want to set up their employee record for employee self-service, uh, you, you can automate that to happen. Um, you see a little C prompt there, that's, your, that's our, my little icon for your command um, node. So that allows you to run um, any command uh, application uh, from your server. Uh, you have access to, to performing uh, all sorts of complex JavaScript. Um, you have web services available to you. So if, if you have a web service that you can um, uh, access, then um, you, know, you can access it through this node. There's the data transform uh, node. So this, this actually uh, accesses the data stage um, tool if you have that. Um, that is a data transformation utility, which is which, which can do very complex data transformation, uh, and uh, it's it's extremely powerful tool. But we're not going to get into it today because it can also be very extremely complex, and you can also perform user actions. Uh, so so that's quite a bit, and there's actually quite a bit more. I'm I'm just highlighting the main ones that I think you might use. Uh, I'm I'm not advancing on the screen here, so. If, some of you are saying the screen is frozen. Um, we haven't really advanced. Uh, we're only on slide four. So, so, uh, so that is really process flow in, in its um, in its entirety. Uh, what it can do is automate the progression of these uh, these tasks that you might have. So, it basically it can take a business process and it can automate all the different steps of it with as much logic as you want to put in there or as little logic as you want to put in there. So what can it do? Um, it can do lots of things, but really it, it can build interfaces between the Lawson application and other systems. So for example, if you have a time entry system somewhere that you want to take data from and bring it into Lawson, very easy to do. If you've got an order entry system that, that you want to interface with Lawson, uh, you can do that on a real-time basis or on a batch basis or something like that. It, it, can, it can do all of that. Um, so interfacing between the application and other systems. Uh, the other is to perform automation and information flow within the Lawson S3 application. So that means if you've got a current process that's happening and you want to change the information flow or automate some other action in some way, you can make that happen. Uh, so that can be very powerful. For example, let's say you've got a requisition that happens and uh, that's entered. So based on the, the event of that creation of that requisition, you can create other business processes that happen. So one of those things is uh, one of the examples uh, that a lots of clients have implemented is a requisition approval um, uh, flow, uh, which we actually did a, uh, a webinar on how to go about implementing something like that uh, the previous time that's available on the site. Uh, you can, you can, most people don't know this, but you can actually build interfaces between two completely separate systems, not even including Watson. So if I had uh, a, a web front end to some application like an order entry system, and then I also had another, um, another application that kept track of my inventory, technically, if I wanted to combine those together, I could use this tool to do it. Um, so, so it's quite powerful in that way. Not a lot of clients use it in that way, but it is, it, it's very capable of doing things like that. Um, you can have it perform automated maintenance tasks. Uh, so like, like the example we kind of quickly used earlier, like adding users or updating users. You can create approval chains and scenarios. So that, that kind of goes back to that, um, the, that example of the requisition uh, flow where you can create requisition approvals in multiple levels. Uh, you can have it call outside applications to do other things. Um, so an example of that uh, could be using that command prompt that uh, I said earlier to run almost any other application. So you could have it run a Windows PowerShell script, for example, that could do almost anything. So <clears throat> what are the different components of this super powerful tool? So, so really, when you, when you look at uh, process flow, uh, from a 10,000 foot view, 
there are some client-side components, and then there are some server-side components. Now, for, for the purposes of developing uh, a, a flow and actually um, deploying it, there's very few of these tools that you need to know about. In fact, if you knew only about the process flow designer, you might be okay with just knowing that. There's, um, but there, there's, there's server-side components like RMI, the process flow server, scheduler, and event manager that are always running on the server. Now, those are things that you don't need to um, modify or, or touch once they're set up correctly and they're running. They're, they're something your system administrator knows about and knows how to take care of. You don't need to know anything about those. On the client side, so that's on your local machine, on your PC, um, you have the process flow designer, uh, which we're going to use today. That is your most important tool for actually creating new flows. You have your administrator, you have your scheduler, and you have your event management console. Now, those three tools we're not going to touch today, but you can kind of tell what they do. They uh, the scheduler obviously allows you to schedule a flow to run uh, so, uh, or a process to run, more, more correctly said. Um, the administrator and the event management consoles, they're there to help you see the status of flows, help you maybe kill them or restart them or, or see, um, you know, what state they're in. So today we're going to do a very quick sample project that employs different pieces of uh, process flow, just to show you how powerful it can be to do uh, very quick um, uh, processing and very quick development time. Uh, really, the biggest advantage of process flow is you don't need to be very technical to use it, and it can do some very heavily technical and very, very complex applications uh, with, with little, very little development time. So the, the project we're going to do today, and this is this was taken from, uh, we had several suggestions from you uh, on, our, on our site on, on what to do. Some of them were very great ideas, but they were too complex for a very quick session. And I'm more than happy to uh, do an advanced uh, version of this uh, next month or so that we can take on some of the um, more complex ideas that you guys wanted to see, like, the, like using the RM node. Uh, we can do that in an advanced session later. But today we're going to uh, do a simple extract of uh, some employee records out of Lawson into a CSV file. And then we're going to introduce some logic to differentiate between records. Uh, and then we're going to send out an email if a record matches a certain logic criteria. Okay, so this is a this is this is actually taken from uh, an example of something that we've done for a client before. This is a simplified version of it, but it it, it certainly is a is a complete application. So before we get into the tool, uh, we uh, we would need to know how to log in, and uh, the the tool that we're going to use for this is the Process Flow Designer. Now you'll notice when you go to your Start menu, Lawson Software Process Flow. There's two designers. This is uh, we we in this example we're going to use the uh, the ellipse version of the designer, and that's the one I recommend using with version uh, with application version 901 and and um, and newer. Uh, so you you actually uh, for the process flow server name you're going to enter the same URL as you normally would for your portal, but you don't need the HTTP and your username and password. Uh, and keeping in mind that your user needs to be a process flow user, uh, and that's set up in, in lots of security and within process flow. So your system administrator should know how to set you up as a process flow user. Um, and uh, many of you, uh, just being on the field, I know this, many of you, if you're the sysadmin or the developer, you, you might have the lost in username password. Uh, that typically is already set up. So. Um, if you have that kind of privilege, you could you could use that just to do a quick flow. But I don't recommend it. I recommend having uh, uh, your user be set up as a process as a, a process flow user, so you can develop flows. So uh, before we get into actually loading the application, I want to uh, I want to kind of go over what the designer is because it can look a little scary when you first look at it. It's a very crowded screen, but uh, but it's actually quite a simple screen. Um, so. Uh, the the white area on the right side where I've got labeled workspace, that area is your workspace. That's really where you mo do most of the work. So uh, 
you can think of that as your canvas where you're laying out all your flow. Uh, the, the area that's labeled nodes, which is this uh, vertical toolbar, that's where all the different actions reside within process flow. So if there's something you're looking to do and it's possible, then chances are that it sits there. And then the only other part that's very important is once you've got a node highlighted on your canvas, the properties for that node show up on the left side, on the lower left side where I've, I've labeled it node, prop, node properties. So to modify the properties of a node, you do that on the left side of the screen right there. Um, the other thing to point out is that the version of the designer is a tab-driven um, design, which is really nice. So you can open multiple flows into multiple tabs. Uh, I definitely recommend, um, you know, doing that um, and, and be very aware of which tab you're working in because you could modify the wrong flow, obviously, if you're not paying attention. At the bottom of your screen, you got the debug console. So that, that helps you debug your application. Uh, and and um, you might get a chance to look at that. So um, here we go. We're going to try to do the, the, a live demo here and uh, work with me while we try that. So let's see. Um, other, let's see. So can anybody see the process flow designer that I have up? If you could please let me know that on the bottom of your screen on the left. Okay, great. Uh, excellent. So you guys can see that. Wonderful. Okay. So you've got the process flow very small, but yes. Okay. So let me make it bigger. Um, very difficult to do this and still see your comments. Hang on a quick second. Let's see. Okay, can you guys can you guys see it in its entirety or is, is some of it cut off for you? Okay, so looks like that's better. Okay, excellent. So we'll we'll keep it we'll keep it in this excellent. Thank you. Um all, all of that feedback is gonna sound really funny in the recording, but <laughs> um so okay, so we're gonna do a quick design here. Uh, I all I've done here, and actually, let me let me let me start a new file so that you know what I've done. Uh, if I go to the file menu, I can say new process flow, and you notice the minute I open a process flow at the very start, I have a start node and an end node. Now, those are very important because. Those are the two nodes that are in every single flow you ever look at. You can't get rid of those things, so don't don't try to get rid of them, right? Um, so I'm, we're, we're always going to start with these. And then another thing to, to know right away before you, we go much further is the way you connect nodes together is you use this connection, um, so, uh, this connection tool right there. So that I'm pointing, hopefully you can see this, I'm pointing at the... Uh, uh, the arrow um, in, in, the, in the toolbar to the left of the workspace. So it says connection. So when I do that, I can click on one item and then I can click on another item and it automatically connects. Okay, so I've created the most, most useless flow ever, which is basically doing nothing at this point. Um, but that is, a, that is a complete flow. Um, but, and and, and notice now I want to get rid of that arrow, that connection. I use the select tool. I select it, and then I'm going to hit the delete button on my keyboard. So that, that gets rid of that um, connection. So remember, we said that we want to, um, we want to uh, do a, a query that brings data back from the database and um, we're going to do that using a SQL query. Um, now, we can have a discussion uh, offline on the, on the site about when to use a SQL query and when to use a uh, Lawson query. We're not going to use a Lawson query here, and, I'll, and, and uh, for, if not for any reason, 
for the reason that you'll notice on the top of your screen where it's spot slow designer, we're actually in the offline mode um, because connecting to a Lawson server wouldn't allow me to have this presentation online at the same time. So I'm actually working offline. Uh, I'm not actually connected to a possible server at the moment. So let's go ahead and, and, and start this. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I want, I want a way to get to this query. Okay, the way I do that is I want to make sure that once my flow starts, the next thing it does is it goes to a query. Done. That's all I have to do is connect the start node to the query node. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to widen this a little bit, and you'll know why in a second. And I've got a little cheat sheet back here of when I did this earlier, so I can kind of see what I'm going to do so I don't forget it. All right, so um, first thing I want to do is write my query. Now, you notice I click on the SQL query, and I can change the name of it, by the way, so I can call this employee query. I could have changed the name up here as well. And I like to change the names of the IDs. Um, I'm going to call that one SQL EMP, and I'll show you why in a second. It's a good idea to do that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste uh, a query that I, SQL query that I wrote earlier. So all this is saying is select employee, first name, last name, EMP status, date hired, process level, email address from employee, where the status is A1. Now, A1 in my case is an active full-time status. And date hired is greater than or equal to the current date, meaning they got hired today or, or there's a higher date in, in the, in, coming up in the future. Um, you, can, you can actually play with this quite a bit. Maybe that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in your scenario. It actually probably doesn't make sense in any scenario, but you get the idea. This is just an example. Okay. So um, notice I've, I've referenced something called current date. Okay. Now that is that is a, a and this this um, this notation here this uh, open or this greater than sign exclamation mark which is closed by a greater than or you know greater than sign. Um, this notation signifies a, a variable within process flow. So if I wanted another variable, for example, I could say, uh, oops, I could say some other variable. That's how process would know I'm trying to, I'm trying to reference an existing variable. But this variable doesn't quite yet exist, so I have to go create it. So let's go create it. You notice in my start node, when I click on that, its properties is a list of variables. I'm going to go ahead and create a variable. Uh, and actually, I think we call it current underscore date. And let's call that a date. And we're going to we're going to use a JavaScript function of today as the very the value of this variable. So we could actually put anything we wanted in here. So I could hard code a date in here. I could say 2013 um, 10 10. I, I could have said that, but I decided I'm going to use the current date every time. Wait, I don't think I need this equal sign. Okay, so now that I've got this variable, you notice if I go back here, I've got a list of variables that show up, and it's off, of, off your screen right now, but I can select uh, current date as one of them, okay? And, and the, the way I got, got that uh, to show up here, let me... Um, let me see if I can make it a little more clear for you. So if you hold down control and space at the same time, 
you get your list of currently defined variables in the system. Now you notice there's other, other there's other variables. We skipped the first few, but you got apps product line, CCS product line, current date, gender, host, lotter, and work unit. So these are these are great variables to have, especially lotter and gender. I'm going to go ahead and um, paste the SQL into the chat so you guys can see it. Uh, thank you for that request. It's a great idea. Okay, so, so now that I've done that, a very long way of explaining that I've just created a node that's going to um, um, that's going to do a SQL query uh, on the server. Now, you might be asking what server, you might be asking how did, this, how did all that set up happen. I'm not gonna answer those questions in this session because they're actually, all, I'll just say this, that all of that setup is already on your server, okay? If it isn't, it needs to be set up, okay? But this is going to actually do a default query against the default database that's set up on your server. And that there is a there's one default, or you can override all of that here. If you check that box, you can you can pick different servers and different database users and and all kinds of different JDBC, JDBC drivers for different databases. Uh, but for now, we're going to take the default that's set up on the server. Okay. So if all I wanted to do was to create a CSV file, which is what I originally started to that I wanted to do. Um, I have a hard time finding the file node. Oh, here it is, file access node. If I want, all I wanted to do was do that, I grab the file access node, and on the left you'll notice I've got, I'll just call this CSV file. And if I wanted to write to file, that's all I got to do there. And then I can say wh where my file goes. I'm going to put this file in the temp directory and call it employee.csv. And for the input data, I'm going to put some variables in here. So I can type anything I want in here, right? But obviously I want to put good information in here. So what I want to put in there is the variables that I got out of this query. But you notice if I just do, if um, pretty annoying because it goes off the screen. If I just do that, you notice my SQL variables are not there. Okay, the SQL variables are not here. And the reason is I haven't connected my SQL node to this file node. So the file node has nothing preceding it so that it doesn't know where to get any variables from. So let's go ahead and connect that to that and that to that. Now I'll explain that in a second, like why why the CSV node needs to be connected to the end of the SQL node. I'll explain that in a second. Let's just go ahead and connect that all up. Okay, so now if I go to the file node, you notice I now have all the SQL data that I wanted to wanted to get access to. So let's say we want the oops. Let's say we want the employee number, comma, the first name. And it doesn't exactly do that very well, but comma last name. And let's say we also wanted the email address in here. You notice it keeps putting the, the fields at the beginning, which is not what I want them to be, but I'm, I'm copying and pasting them to the end. Okay. So can, can you guys see this? Can, it, it sounds like some of you cannot see the properties window. Okay, so the, the properties window, all I'm getting in here is just very, very little bit of text. Uh, it's really small, okay. So if I were to maximize the properties window, this is what you would see. 
All I'm doing is just putting the SQL variables in here. But you notice, okay, so at the very end of it, you're welcome. Uh, at the very end of it, uh, if I were to if I were to use this, this, the next record would end up just at the end of the end of this first line, which isn't what I want. So I actually want to put a carriage return there. All I did was I just hit enter at the very end of that line. So when I move my cursor to the right, it should go to the next line. Okay, so I'm going to minimize this again. Okay, so that's all there is in that file, right? So in so my CSV file is going to get written to with th these variables from my SQL query. It's going to get the employee num number, the first name, the last name, and the email address. So the reason it's sitting in the in between these these two nodes is this: the the query node by its very nature becomes an iterative loop, okay? So it just loops through all the different records that it gets. So let's say my query is gonna get uh, 100 employees. So those would be 100 employees that have an A1 status that have a higher date of today or further in the future. Then let's say there's 100 of them. So it's gonna, it's gonna bring all of those records back and it's gonna go through this loop 100 times. And it will do everything that's sitting inside it 100 times. So what I wanna do is put my file note in here so that as it's going through, every time it writes that entire record into a CSV file, okay? Um, so, uh, so that's really kind of the basic, the most basic way of getting records in. So I'm gonna switch over to my completed flow so you can see some of the other things that I've done in here. This is other, that same get employee uh, record that, or the query that we did earlier. So that you should be familiar with. And this this is the write to CSV that we just did uh, with maybe an, an additional uh, field in here. Now, I wanna introduce you to two other things. So this is the branch node, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and increase the size of this. What the branch node does is it tells process flow if a condition is, if a condition is true, then go down one side, and if the condition is, another condition is true, and the first one isn't, then go down another side. So it creates a fork in the road, basically. There can be as many of these forks in the road as you want. So you could have, I don't know, 100 different conditions, okay? So let's look at the conditions that I've created here. Here I've said, my first leg of my condition is, if the process level of what you're returning is 100. So if these guys are executives, for example, they might be in process level 100. So if process level 100 go down this leg, so follow this logic. And then I've done this, this funny little trick. So I wanna say if everybody else, okay, so if you're not in 100, I could either go ahead and say it's not in 100, do something else. But what if there is some other weird data that's happening? Well, what I wanna do is catch everything all at once. So what I've done here is a trick that I use. I don't know if this is the best way to do it, but this is how I've always done it. I've just said, if one equals one. Now that's always true, okay? And it's the easiest thing for me to remember, so I always do it. There's, you can also do if true, you can also do a number of other things, but I found that if one equals one always works. So I like using that. So I said, if one equals one, go the other way. So what does that mean? Let's go back to our flow. Here, it means that if, if the process level is 100, go and write to this one CSV file. And if, if it's anything else, write to this other CSV file called file other, okay? So there's, now we're creating two different CSV files in this example, we've got, PL100.CSV, see that? So this is just another file node. We said write to file PL100.CSV and we wrote a bunch of stuff from our CSV file, uh, from our query into it. And for the other one, very similar, we just called it differently, file other.CSV, and then we wrote a bunch of stuff into it. Now this has to be the full path, by the way, to where you want the file to end up, okay? And then also in, in the case of the executives in process level 100, I wanna send an email to somebody. 
So what I've done in this case is since there's a new executive that's been hired, so that's usually a big deal, I want to send an email to the help desk at my company saying new, new exec hire. And then I want to say the following exec was added this week. Please set up his exec portal account immediately, okay? Because we don't want our execs to not be, you know, set up when they try to get into the system. So I send the correct information that my help desk is going to need to set up his whatever executive portal. Um, so basically, what happens is a record comes in. If it's a if if it's in process flow 100, it gets written to a file. This email goes out to the help desk, and that's it. If 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 it is not in process flow 100, it just gets written to another file, and that's it. And then and this loop continues as many times as I have records in my SQL query. And then it ends, and that's it. So if you were to upload this to the server, the way you would do it, by the way, is you'd go to um, Tools, Manage Flows. Okay, I can't load that now because I'm in the offline mode, but Manage Flows allows you to upload this to the server. And then the next thing you will do, and now we're going to go back to our presentation. Uh, a quick second. Okay, so you would for testing this on the server, you can you can you can either test it inside the client using the test mode, which we haven't gone over, or you can just point your browser to whatever your server web server name is slash bpm slash menu dot do do. And then there's, you'll notice a section on the left called trigger of flow, and then process flow trigger. So here, once you've uploaded it, you'll be able to uh, change your trigger type to process, and then select the process that you said that you wanted to create or uh, to, to run. And then um, you'll notice several variables down here that you can set. Um, you can forget about the one I've set down here. Um, uh, I said variable name, view date, but that's just some screenshot I was taking, so don't get confused by that. And then once you've, once you've basically selected your flow, you just need a work title, and it just has to be some text. It doesn't have to be anything relevant. So you just type that in, and you hit start. And that will run your process. So how do you debug this? Um, you can, like I said, you can test your flows within the actual flow designer itself. It's re relatively self-explanatory. There's plenty of documentation on that. I'm not going to go over it. You can uh, check the flow uh, log files in uh, Lotter BPM. So in the Lotter directory, there's a BPM directory, and inside that there's a directory called WF log. Each one of your um, flows that run, especially when you do that flow, uh, the trigger flow, they will create a work unit, and each one of those work units, and by work, a work unit is basically just what it sounds like. It's a unit of work, and that's what you're doing. So that, each one of those would create a log file, and if there's an error, it will also create an error file. So you can go through those, and they've got tons of text. If you just read them carefully, you'll know what's wrong, and it's usually relatively easy to debug these things. Um, you can check the uh, process flow administration uh, administrator tool to see the status of your flow. The, the logs are also available through that. You can use the file node that we used earlier to write other variables and messages out, so you can help, that can help you debug it. And then finally, you can try to do the task that you're trying to do manually to see if there's there is something that you're missing. A good rule is if you can't do it manually. Process flow also can't do it. So if you wanted to get more in-depth training in process flow, um, here's what you would learn. You would learn uh, all the common nodes in, in detail. So today you've only learned about three or four of them. So you learned the file node, you learned the SQL node, and you learned the email node, and you learned the start node. Uh, and you actually learned the branch node as well. Um, but you'd learn how to use all the other ones as well in, in a more in-depth class. 
Um, you, you would use the Lawson S3 nodes to perform updates and queries within Lawson. So a common one people like to do is a PA52. So you can, um, uh, you know, perform a personal action. Um, uh, you'd use a SQL node to maybe perform an update or a query on a completely other database other than Lawson. So that, that can be a very powerful thing to have. Um, you can use web services. Like for example, some of the fun ones out there like Google Maps has an open API for web services. So you can create a Google Maps API that gets you directions to a, to a specific address. Like for example, if you're in your materials management system and there's a warehouse you know, or a ship to location, you could print the um, driving directions to that if you wanted to. That, 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 that's pretty amazing that you can do that with this one click tool. Um, you can use the RM, you can learn how to use the RM node to update users and, and uh, uh, add or remove user records. Um, you'd learn how to use the data stage transformation extender tool. Um, now that's two to three days of training just in itself. Um, so just to learn how to create some basic maps within that tool. Uh, well worth it if you know it because it's a very powerful tool. Um, and then you learn how to do some advanced performance considerations and error handling. Now, performance can be a big deal within process flow because if you don't do things the, the way that you should, things can take a very long time to do. Now, uh, if, if you need any additional help, uh, through October 30th, I believe, yeah, through October 30th, we're doing one free day of completely free consulting. No, no, um, no obligation at all. Uh, you just you can send me an email uh, or you can call me at the number on the screen and we'll do one free day of remote consulting for you to get your project started, help you design it out. Um, uh, hopefully it's not a full day. Maybe you just kind of need some help to kind of get started in a, in, a, in a group meeting. But if it's more than that, more than welcome to do it. Um, and uh, we have uh, 14 uh, consultants that are ready to help you with any of your projects. So, so it could be process flow, it could be anything else. Uh, whatever it is you need uh, to get your project started, uh, we're willing to help you for, a, a, like, a, like I said, a full day without any obligation, no other information needed. Um, so uh, our next webinar, uh, we're shooting for November 14th. Uh, it'll be available on the site. You'll get an email in advance and all that good stuff. If, uh, if you're not on our email list, uh, uh, please get on it. Uh, if, if you're already on uh, if you're in this class, you're on our email list. So that's that's how you know whether or not you are. Uh, the next class is going to be an amazing one. It's one you don't want to miss. And I don't say that about all our classes. The next one is the one that's going to save you tons and tons and tons of headaches and money. Custom development. How to choose the right tool for the job. So if you want to do an interface in something, should you use process flow? Should you create a 4GL? Should you go third party? Should you, what should you do? How do you choose a tool? If you want to create a report, do you do it in LBI? Do you do it in process flow? Do you write a 4GL report? So we're going to tell you in, a, in, a, in hopefully no more than half an hour. I apologize for this one running so long. But um, in, in hopefully no more than half an hour, we're going to teach you how exactly to do that, how to choose between these different tools that are available to you. There is um, there's literally 10, 20 different ways of doing something within this environment, and there's only one great way to do it. So um, we're going to uh, hopefully be able to cover that uh, next time and really hope you join us. And please go to our site and suggest new courses. We're, we're, we're running out of ideas on how to contribute to this community with good courses all the time. So we've come up with some ourselves. We've got some great suggestions. Please, please, please go there and suggest new uh, courses. They're obligation-free. They're completely free. You can email them to people. They'll be available online afterwards. It's just from our commitment to contribute to this community of great users. Um, so please do that. And please feel free to take us up on our one-day free offer. Um, and so at this point, I will take questions. Uh, I'm going to stop recording. The, well, I'll continue recording, but and I'll take questions for this presentation. I saw one earlier, which was, what version was this for? This um, this was for the 901 uh, process flow integrator tool. Um, this, this, what, what we did today should apply to everything 901. Uh, in fact, it, it will apply to everything um, prior to that as well. Um, but uh, all, the, all the 901 versions would work. Uh, I think the process flow 
uh, designer version I was using is 901.10, but they all look the same, so you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, attached, uh, I think you mean, uh, so let's see, do you, can you attach, do you, did you attach the CSV file to the email, is that possible? Oh, um, yes, uh, I'm sorry, yes, that is, that is possible, so um, I'm going to go back and uh, let me share the screen one more time. So hopefully you can see this again. Um, uh, so on the email node, I'm going to switch to the attachment tab. And I can, uh, I believe it would be, apologize for this, let me, uh, let me minimize that again. We're here on the email node, on the attachment tab, increase the size. Yeah, so I can take the, the file, output data and attach it. Or another way to do that actually, yeah, I think that's the only way. Uh I could I could be wrong. Sometimes you have to test these things a couple of times. But yeah, that's that's how you do it. There's an attachment tab here. You can attach any of these things. Um, or you can actually um, give it create the file path, and you can pass it the entire file path. Um, there's so many great other things that I want to point out, so it will take hours. <laughs> so let me, uh, oops, I guess you couldn't see that. Um, um, here, Sorry about that. So here's what I did. I just went to the email node um, under the attachment tab. And I selected whatever I wanted to attach, and then I pushed it to the right, and that would become an attachment. Hopefully, you can see that. Did you guys see that? Okay, see it now. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, the email the email note is quite powerful. Um, works really well. Um, Anything, any other questions? Do I have experience with LPA 10? Y yes, I do. Uh, there's actually quite, if, if you know how to use this, you'll know how to use that. It's a little bit different uh, in uh, its presentation. Uh, and it, it's got some more functionality. Um, a lot, lot more use of like landmark functionality and whatnot. But um, yes, uh, do have experience with LPA 10, um, and if you know this, moving to that is not going to be a big problem for you. 